Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Yes, you deserve all the glory to you, it's all the glory, all honor, all power. Hallelujah, 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 you're worthy. Oh, we, we barely participate in, in those things that you are the only one that can do. Oh, what about We're just messengers, but you're the you're the message, <laughs> and you're the power. the The message has the power. Oh, Rabasir. Oh, Rabasir. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is so good. You guys already cold or should I keep keep it on? You're okay? okay. All right. Praise God. <laughs> We're so blessed. We're so blessed. Uh, pastor friend of ours, uh, where we're going in our mission trip, the, the head of the ministry has been under attack, and uh, we just got a report that um, there was a tumor in her body, and she threw it up. <laughs> After they've been praising and praising all afternoon. So, yeah, he couldn't stand the presence of God. Amen. <laughs> Put the presence of God on. The enemy can't stand it for too long. The torture. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So tonight, Pastor Pam is going to be sharing. So we welcome you to the River of Fire Ministries. And uh, we thank you for being with us. Amen. <laughs> Let me just say some things before she comes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, I've been I've been uh, meditating a little bit on this um and I have preached on that, but you can always get more revelation on something even if you study it or you know in the past, studied it in the past. So anyway, um, talking about the commandments of God, how powerful they are, and I'm not talking about uh, the Ten Commandments of Moses, which most people think of those when, or, or the 633 laws that were in the Old Covenant for that matter, but I'm talking about something that is clearly seen in Acts chapter 1 and um, verse 2. It says, uh, the, I'm, I'm reading the ESV, I don't know why. <laughs> Let me read the Net Bible just out of... Um, kind of like it. It says, until he was... And I'll put it there in a minute. <laughs> Acts 1, 2. Um, praise God. Glory. Let me just read it. Uh, it says, until the day he was taken up to heaven, after talking about Jesus, after he, he had given orders, and some other versions says commands, by the Holy Spirit... To the apostles he had chosen. Hallelujah. So this is after he resurrected. He spent 40 days um, with the disciples teaching them. You know, that must have been a very interesting Bible college. <laughs> intensive class. 
for 40 days with the resurrected Christ, now under the new covenant where he said there's a lot of stuff you cannot bear right now but because, you know, we're under the old covenant, but when the Holy Spirit comes in the new covenant, he shall lead you to all truth. So even though he was teaching in person, he was doing these things by the Holy Spirit. That's the way it happens in the new covenant. But notice that there are orders or commands in the, in the new covenant. These are different. These are by the Holy Spirit. And since I'm not preaching tonight, <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, if that's the case, let me... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, well, this is not planned, just like the Lord likes it. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Maybe we should uh, say something about the, our pastor friend. Uh, she is like a mother to us and a uh, very sweet family. All the children are serving the Lord. All of them are pastors the granddaughters are pastors, youth pastors. I mean, everybody's pastor. I have to call everybody pastor there. And uh, we, we've been uh, sending messages to help with their faith. And they're the kind of people that are so ready to receive revelation and apply it in their lives. And... Um, well, you know, I told her, it's just that God allows us to participate in something that only he can do. We, we are not the healers, so we're not going to heal. Uh, you know, he is the healer, so it's not us. Oh, but somebody should be anointed. Yeah, they sh we should be anointed. But it's Jesus who heals. And if it's the anointing, it's the anoint his anointing. He's the anointed one. That's his title. Anyway, uh, the uh, donkey. <laughs> That carry Jesus can say, "Oh, I'm so wonderful." People were putting their their capes and their coats uh, for me to walk on. They were worshiping me. No, he tried to tell that to his wife, and his wife said, "You're a donkey." Anyway, has nothing to do with anything, right? Anyway, um, where were we? <laughs> I'm loud here. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, and you know they say we have been encouraging them, but really they have been encouraging us with how they take the word and. And apply it. And they don't stop. They are worshiping all afternoon. They're with the... You know, uh, I, I, it made me think of uh, something I read with um, John G. Lake. He was an evangelist in the uh, last part of the 1800s and in the beginning of the 1900s. He was a tremendous um, missionary in Africa. In fact, there was a, a, a 
sickness, uh, contagious uh, plague or something in, in Africa, and um, people would um, foam out of their mouth, and if you touch that, you were, you were infected. And so they noticed that he was helping, even burying people and touching them like nothing. And um, the, the doctors asked him, how come you're not getting sick? And he, you know, you're not using gloves or anything. <laughs> What's going on? And he said, I believe Romans 8, 2, that says that the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the spirit of sin and death. And he actually did believe that. You know, because you can quote the, the scripture, but that doesn't guarantee you're believing it. But to the point that they they uh, challenged to to uh, or he challenged them actually I believe if I remember the story correctly that um they um they would analyze that uh, for them to analyze under the microscope what happened when he touched that foam out of people and. Uh, and it died. I mean, as soon as it touched his skin, that those those germs or whatever it was, it died. And anyway, but he also, if I remember correctly too, it's a few years I read it, but um, he had he had hospitals, clinics, where he had his disciples. Pray for the sick. There was no um, like nurses or medicine. There was just a believer. Yeah, confessing the word, praying for the sick. You know, and and their their passing grade was, you heal the person. <laughs> they had to stay there until they 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 got healed. And so it made me think of them spending all that time worshiping God with their grandma and, and mom. Um, and until the presence of God just to fill the place. Also made me, yeah, also made me think of when Jesus showed up in the synagogue. The demons cried out, your, your presence is tormenting us. Are you going to? Are you going to send us already or how, what? Yeah, so they had to go. <laughs> they can stand that presence. And you know, he comes when you actually worship him in spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, yeah. I need to put that on, on your screen. Hold on a sec. Hallelujah. There you go. There's the Bible. <laughs> now read it. I'm kidding. So, okay, let's go to... This is what? Uh, the NIV. Cool. Let's, let's, let's use the, the Net Bible for a second. I was not planning to preach. Uh, whatever it comes out, it comes out. <laughs> anyway, let's go, yeah, to Acts 1. In verse 2, it says, Until the day he was taken up to heaven, uh, after he had given orders. I like that translation. Um, or commands. Although some mod modern translation render uh, as instru uh, that were as instructions, they were implies authority or official sanction. So that a word like orders conveys the idea more effectively. The action of the temporal participle is an ante antecedent or prior to the action of the verb it modifies. So. All that to say, it is an order. <laughs> it is with authority. 
but is by the Holy Spirit. But he still gives commands. He still gives orders by the Holy Spirit. And so that is a uh, change in things because the commands in the Old Testament were in tablets of stone written outside men. They were not alive. They didn't have life. They were not inside men. And therefore, couldn't, uh, in, it wasn't by the Spirit, so it can give the person the ability to do it. In fact, no one fulfilled the, even the Ten Commandments. Somebody said, but I never kill anyone. Well, but Jesus said, if you this, this, the, the, desire it in your heart, you're already killing the person. <laughs> Or, or, you know, I never commit adultery, but if he's, uh, Jesus said, if you desire in your heart, you're already committing adultery. So he put the commandments even closer to where no one can say, I never broke the law. Therefore, the only one that actually fulfilled the law was uh, Jesus. Jesus was a man that uh, even though he was surrounded by people under the old covenant, he himself was a man in the style of the new covenant. Okay? He was born of the Spirit. But all the rest of the people around him, until he died and resurrected, no one was in the new covenant. He had to shed his blood the blood of the new covenant, to be able to start the new covenant. Without, without shedding of blood, there is no covenant. Because it's a blood covenant. So, he can talk to people, you know, if, if, if you go to a place and you're a believer, and everybody else is an unbeliever, you have to explain things at their level because their mind is barely catching because <laughs> the devil is trying to blind their minds. So uh, you have to demonstrate the power of God. You have to uh, uh, preach to them the good news and trust the Holy Spirit to convince them. So the Holy Spirit little by little convince them. So, you know, co convincing somebody is not automatic. Somebody convinces you of buying a, an expensive uh, uh, vacuum cleaner, right? Have you had people to get, go to your house and they want to demonstrate this very expensive, like, I don't know, $8,000 vacuum cleaner and... Uh, they uh, try to convince you, and they they throw a lot of uh, dirt on your carpet, and then they vacuum it, and hopefully it's not broken. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't happen automatic. They don't say, oh, you're convinced. You're buying it. No, <laughs> I'm not buying it, especially not for that price, right? You, it would be very hard to convince you, right? So the Holy Spirit is working with people that really don't, don't want to, you know, but he knows how to invite them, is, is, is how to show them little by little their need of Jesus. And, you know, it's, 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 it's another level when you're ministering to people that are not born again. It's not the same. You cannot preach the same when you're preaching to believers than somebody that is not a believer. You know, and sometimes we need to do like, you know, just evangelistic meetings and we, we're just going to proclaim the, the work of Christ and their need uh, that they have for Christ. But anyway, he Jesus was like that, but now he's under the new covenant and he is given orders by the Holy Spirit. Also, in verse 3, to the same apostles, also after his suffering, he presented himself alive with many convincing proofs, 
uh, he was seen by them over a 40-day period and he spoke about matters concerning the kingdom of God. So, you know, 40 days teaching, explaining, and now they're getting it because now they're born again. So this is another level of teaching right here. The glorified Jesus, uh, now he is revealing things that he couldn't reveal before. And so, you know, somebody said it, it was the, uh, and how you say that, an hallucin hallucination. Like the disciples just saw him because they were so sad and, well, you know, let's say the and for the, you know, for uh, giving the benefit of the doubt that they had a, a hallucination the first day. But don't tell me they have a hallucination for 40 days. <laughs> what are you smoking? Right? That can't be. What kind of people are you? But where are you on, right? No, no. He and then he presented many convincing proofs. Uh, you know, uh, he ate with them. He uh, he spoke. He uh, let them touch him. You know, he uh, he was basically now showing them. The beginning of this new dispensation. In verse 4, the, there's one, at least one of the commandments that is mentioned in verse 2. At least one is specifically mentioned. He says, well, while, while he was with them, he declared, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for uh, what my father promised, which you heard about from me. Verse 5, because uh, for John... Baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, the resurrection already has happened. I don't know. I don't understand some people that teach that the disciples got born again on the day of Pentecost. No, no, no. Don't, don't get confused. Okay? Uh they got born again the first day of the resurrection when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed. Did, did Jesus fail? No. Somebody said it's, it was like a symbol of what? No. He didn't say this is a symbol. He breathed the Holy Spirit. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the difference is this. The first day of the resurrection they got born again or got the spirit within. They became the temple of the Holy Spirit. He who joins the Lord is one with him in spirit. But what happened, and, and it's basically the same experiences that Jesus had. Jesus was born of the spirit, conceived by the spirit. But when he was 30 years old, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that conceived him, now comes upon him in power in a, almost a tangible way, uh, you know, because even in one of the Gospels says in a corpor corporal way, like almost tangible way, invisible, like this Shekinah glory. And he said, and descended upon him like a dove. It, it didn't say it was. It's not like the Hollywood movies that a dove just flies upon Jesus' shoulder and that's the Holy Spirit. No, no. The Holy Spirit is not a dove, okay? <laughs> he descended very softly, softly in, in, in the way a dove descends. Also, a dove is, is a, you know, the law had clean and unclean animals. It's not that they were dirty. It's just that they were not used for sacrifices. <laughs> you know, you only use certain kind of animals for sacrifices. So you cannot just offer anything, you know, uh, your pig or something. You know, you don't. You had to choose a lamb or a dove or, you know. But anyway, 
he descended very softly like a dove, like talking about a very specific um, anointing upon him. And um, what happens after that is that he starts doing miracles. If you read what John the Baptist says, I saw the Spirit descending upon him, and the one that sent me uh, to baptize with water told me oh, upon him you see the Holy Spirit descend upon and remain upon. He is the one that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So now... For the first time ever in history, the Holy Spirit is not just coming upon a person, but is remaining upon a person, the person of Jesus. He is the first one that ever had that. All the other prophets had, had the Spirit for, for a time period, but it wasn't a permanent, dwell, a permanent, permanent abo abode upon them. And much less, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, lived inside them. He didn't live inside them. They were not the temple. Never in the Old Testament you, s you see that people were the temple of the Holy Spirit. Only the building. Because he couldn't live inside people until the price was paid with the blood of Jesus for that to be able to happen. So... That's a big difference. The Old Testament allowed for the Holy Spirit to come temporarily upon people. That's why the prophet would say, and the hand of the Lord came upon me because it wasn't on him. It came temporarily and then it lifted. It wasn't on them all the time. Okay. Uh, but in the New Covenant, the only reference that I can think of, you help me in search the, the New Testament, but the only one reference that I can think of to the hand of God is in uh, uh, Peter, where he says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So the only instruction is to humble, meaning that the hand is upon people, uh, believers. So basically, Jesus introduced the way that the Holy Spirit was going to be available for you and I, not only on the inside, being the temple of the Holy Spirit, but upon us in power like he had and uh, uh, in a permanent way if we humble ourselves. You know, if you're in pride, you know, he's, he has to, you're, you're sticking up too high, so he has to remove the hand so you, uh, you learned your lesson <laughs> Because it says that if you humble yourself, he'll uh, exalt you. So if you start doing his job, which is to exalt yourself, he has to do your job, which is to humble you. You don't want to do his job, so he doesn't have to do your job. But anyway, it's available. As far as you humble yourself on that, under that hand, amen. Okay, but in here, the one commandment was in verse 4, Acts 1, 4, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for my father's promise, which you heard about me, and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Don't confuse the two. I don't, I don't see how you can confuse the two. Amen. Because in, in, in uh, chapter 8, for example, the Samaritans got saved, got even baptized in water. And after they got saved, they sent Peter and John to pray for them so the Holy Spirit could, could come upon them. They were already believers. They had been even baptized in water. So were they saved? Yeah. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, right? They were definitely the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you must be the temple of the Holy Spirit. But they still were missing something. 
but that the Holy Spirit will come upon them and remain upon them. Uh, so, praise God, he commanded them, he declared or commanded, uh, it says, uh, uh, it says declare, but is in, in the meaning is uh, to transmit a message or by implication to en enjoin or give in a charge or command. Command. So you can say, you can read, in fact, some, uh, actually some versions do have it like that, right? The King James have, has it like that. Uh, while he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait there. For what my father promised you, which you heard about from me. So the father promised, but they, how did they hear it? Through Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me make, get my uh, water. Thank you, Pastor Pam. Also, thank you for the invitation to preach. Right. Um, so now he is telling them or commanding them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait until they're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Didn't they already have the Holy Spirit? Yes. Inside them, yes. Which is only possible in the New Covenant. But they were missing something else. In fact, in verse 6, uh, actually verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It doesn't say inside you. There's two different things there. The Spirit within and the Spirit upon. Very important to know the difference. Very important, because um, they're not the same. Uh, here, the Spirit, it says that you will receive power. So, apparently, you know, to be witnesses, right? Or to be able to uh, testify about Jesus and produce evidence. A witness produces evidence. And so there's a power to produce evidence that Jesus is real. That power Jesus had when he was 30 years old to produce uh, evidence of who he was and the will of God to heal people, to deliver people, to teach and preach with the anointing of God, with the authority of God. And so, that is not what you receive in the new birth. And the new birth is more of the life of God, you know, and the character and the new nature of God, the nature of God, new nature in your spirit, really. But in the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a mantle or something upon you to endow you or uh, enable you to produce evidence with the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Basically, to testify about Jesus. Not the same. Okay, so don't be confused. Why make things harder? It's clear that on the first night of the resurrection, he appeared to them and he breathed the Holy Spirit in them. Right? Uh, but 40 days, uh, actually 50 days later, 
the Holy Spirit came upon them. You know, somebody says, well, if, if you believe that, you know, being baptized in the Spirit is the same as being born again, then the only evidence that you're saved is speaking in tongues. Right? We don't preach that. I mean, there's people that preach that. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not even saved. That, that's not what it says there. What if somebody, uh, one of the disciples that believed in Jesus and got born again before the day of Pentecost, died before the day of Pentecost? Is he, is he born again? Yes, he is. Even the, the thief on the cross that repented, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. That's not where it's unsaved people go. You know. But it's just, let me just uh, go to a uh, couple of places, right? Uh, let's go to Acts. We'll be back here. I don't know where we're going. Or <laughs> but the Lord does. Acts 19.1. It says, while uh, Apollos was in Corinth, Paul went through the inland regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples there. So, what happened? Paul was in his missionary uh, trip and got to a place called Ephesus. I, I, I really like Ephesus. I don't know. It, it has some... What happened there, you know, everything, the, the, the letter to the Ephesians and everything, it's just fantastic or wonderful, let me say. But it's, no, it's not fantastic, it's real. Um, in verse uh, 2, he's, uh, okay, so verse 1, we, it says that they, they, he found some people that were disciples. So at, at the very least, he asked them, are you believers? Uh, do, are you disciples? And they say, yes, we are. Do you believe in the Messiah and uh, the anointed one? Yes, yes, we do. Because they identify him, themselves as, dis as disciples. So the next question for the disciples is, and said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They, re they reply, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So they believe because they, they, they say they're disciples, but they haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see why. Uh, 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 several things. One is Paul asking them, how did you get baptized then? Verse 3, so Paul said, into what? This is Acts 3.19. Into what then were you baptized? You know, because you're telling me you're disciples, but you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. So he probably asked, are you baptized? They said, yes. Okay, the Holy Spirit? No, no, we didn't know about the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, how did you get baptized? What is the baptism that you received then? Uh, they said, into John's baptism. Wait, wait, and he said, he said, wait a minute. <laughs> John baptism was a baptism to prepare the people for the one to come. The message of John the Baptist was, there's one that is coming after me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So it's like a pre-gospel. Because the gospel is he came. He already came. He already died, resurrected. I mean, no, oh, he will come and he will save you. No, he already did it, right? So it is a um, pre-gospel, let's put it that way, that prepare people for the gospel, okay? The, 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 in fact, John the Baptist had been dead at this point at least between 10 and 20 years. So his message is still getting people ready for Jesus. So you can be dead and your message still getting people for the Lord. And 
So verse uh, 4, Paul said, John baptized with baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is in Jesus. So basically, Paul is saying, he already came. You're, you're, you're a little behind in the news, okay? There wasn't internet, there wasn't radio. I mean, things, you know, got there slowly. But now they're catching up. Jesus already came. He was preparing the people for when Jesus came, would come. But now uh, he already came. In verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the, so the baptism of John didn't count. They needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Some people say, oh, okay, so it's in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing. The Bible says that the fullness of God dwells bodily in Jesus. So when you are baptized in the name of Jesus, you're being baptized in the name of the Father and in the name of the Holy Spirit. But since people are so baby about this <laughs> and they want to argue... When I baptize, I, I say this, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Okay? So I cover everybody. Because it, it is ridiculous to argue about this. It's the same thing. And so, because the Bible says, do everything in the name of Jesus. So you can say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, and you're good. And there's no argument. You know, there's been even divisions in the church about this little thing. That, that shouldn't even happen. Uh, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So now that they know the news, now they get baptized in water. When it says in the name of... It's talking about baptism in water, okay? And when, when uh, Paul placed his hands on them, after they came out of the water, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They already baptized in water. Don't tell me they're not the temple of the Holy Spirit. Or how is it? Are, are you saying that you, you believe and get baptized in water and you're still not saved? And don't have the Holy Spirit in you. And so the Bible says, if you believe and are baptized, you are saved. You're not condemned. And if you're saved, that means the Holy Spirit moved into you. He who joins the Lord is one with him in spirit. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But now the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And what happened? They began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Yeah? Those are other manifestations that are part of the enablement when it, he comes upon you. They didn't prophesy when they came out of the water. They prophesied when the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke in tongues after the Spirit came upon him. Because it's part of the enablement that comes when he comes upon you. It's not the same as the Holy Spirit in you. Holy Spirit in you. Uh, it's the same Holy Spirit, two different manifestations, two different, uh, uh, you know, things. Uh, it's like with electri electricity, you, you get a fan and electricity produces motion, but you get a light bulb and electricity produces light. It's the same electricity, but it produces two different things. And so the same Holy Spirit, boy, he can produce a lot of stuff, so don't tell me he cannot do that. Um, so you can see here very clearly, they're not the same salvation, simple salvation, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit are two different things. Um, okay, so also let's... Let's go. So, in case you still have doubts, which doubts are welcome. If you have questions 
or want to confirm something, that, sh that is great. In fact, I would love to, make, to do a service where there's questions and answers. And if I don't know the answer, I know somebody that does. <laughs> and I can ask him. <laughs> well, it says that in uh, uh, Acts 8, 5, Philip went down to the main city of Samaria. Remember, Jesus said, you, sh you will receive power to be my witnesses after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, upon you. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, uh, you know, Judea, Samaria, and until the end of... And now, finally, they're going to Samaria. <laughs> this is chapter 8. And, you know, some people say it, 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 it would be interesting to be able to confirm that. But I heard some people say that is, um, each chapter is more or less one or two... Um, is the summary of one or two years of history of the church. Let's let's assume that's correct. Uh, anyway, it is it is a while after the the chapter one, and at this point, um, finally they're going to Samaria. I mean, they had the power to go to the end of the earth, but they're not going. Hello? They have the power to go to Samaria in chapter one and chapter two. But they don't go there until they're persecuted and are forced to go there. And now they're preaching there. You know, it it it, it reminds me of uh, what happened when God told Adam and Eve to fill the earth, multiply and fill the earth. They did multiply, but they didn't fill the earth. They stayed in one place. There were, and, and then, uh, you know, until the, the Tower of Babel, or Babel, uh, that um, they uh, finally got their languages mi mixed up, and they couldn't communicate, so they, they spread. So God had to intervene to actually, because, you know, if you know the problems with big cities, is there's a lot of sin in it. You find more unbelievers in big cities than everywhere, anywhere else. I'm not saying that they're bad. They're, I like uh, big cities because there's a lot of people to preach to. Uh, and Paul went to many big cities. But what I'm saying is it's easier to get detached even from, from creation and uh, get into your own world in a big city and, uh, you know, th there's, there's more opportunity for sin when there's a lot of people. <laughs> Do you realize that? <laughs> you know, I, I've been to, like, where I was born, it's a city like about nine, probably ten millions by now. I, they, they used to say ten millions back then, but then they began to say nine million. So, but, I mean, that's a lot of people, and there's a Places that are very dangerous in there. You don't want you. You really need protection to go to some places. Either supernatural protection or natural protection or both. <laughs> but anyway, that happens in big cities. There's more crime, etc. More poverty. Yeah. Anyway, they finally go to Samaria in chapter 8. And they began proclaiming the uh, Christ to them. Verse 6, the crowds were uh, paying attention with one mind to what Philip, this is Philip the evangelist, as they heard and saw the miraculous signs he was performing. So not only they heard the preaching of Philip, they also saw signs and miracles. You agree? And um, in verse uh, seven, four unclean spirits crying out, crying with loud shrieks, were coming out. You know, uh, yeah, unclean spirits don't like the presence of God. 
And they, they were coming out with many, uh, of, out of many who were possessed, and many paralyzed and lame people were healed. Praise God. They got, so Philip had the power, right? He received the power in chapter 2. Now he's using it in Samaria, chapter 8. Verse 8, so there was great joy, joy in that city. It's going to talk about Simon, a guy that used to be a wizard and deceive people. But anyway, let's keep the guy. And uh, verse 11 says, and they, the Samaritans, paid close attention to him. Uh, well, you know, the, 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 the wizard. So let's jump to verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he was proclaiming the good news, right? They, they believed him, the good news, about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They began to be baptized, both men and women. So, let me ask you, here's the quiz. Are they saved? They believe the message of the gospel, and now they're being baptized. Are they saved or not? They're saved, right? Definitely saved. If, if we said they're not saved, then, then we're denying like half of the Bible, <laughs> right? Believing and getting baptized. I'm not saying yeah, you couldn't be saved without being baptized, but uh, what I'm saying is just in case you believe that, <laughs> here it is. They also got baptized. I mean, somebody can believe in their deathbed and they don't have a chance to get baptized. They're still saved. You know, but of course he, the Lord wants us to be baptized because he said to do that, right? Uh, but, you know, when it says he who believes and is baptized shall be saved and then he who doesn't believe shall be what? Condemned. Notice that the, the let's say, formula of getting condemned it's just not believing. It doesn't say, even if you believe but you don't get baptized, then you're, you're not saved. It doesn't say that. You know? Uh, so, you know, it's like I, one time I asked somebody if they, they were believers, they were saved. And they said, yeah, I was baptized. And I said, I didn't ask you if you were baptized. He just baptized. I mean, I think uh, Mormons baptized. That doesn't mean somebody's saved just because they went in the swimming pool. Or you and your vacation, when you went in the swimming pool, you got saved then. No, that, that is not. it doesn't matter how many times you jump in the swimming pool. You have to believe. That's the way to be saved. In verse 13, even Simon, the, the sorcerer, the, the wizard, himself believed, and after he was baptized... He also believed and he was baptized. He didn't have his mind renewed, but he was saved. Because we're going to see what happened to him. He stayed close to Philip constantly. And when he saw the signs and great miracles that were occurring, he was amazed. So he used to deceive people, but now he's seeing the real power. And he's um, even he that knows how to trick and do, uh, you know, uh, magic arts and stuff. He is amazed because he's seen the real thing. Verse 14. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem. So all this is happening in Samaria. But the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. What happened in Samaria? They accepted the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them. Why? 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 Verse 15. These two went down and prayed for them. So that they would receive the Holy Spirit. What? I thought they were saved. They already got all the spirit that they needed. No. There's more. <laughs> there's always more of the spirit. In verse 16. For the spirit had not yet come upon any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So are they Two different things? Yes. Two different things. Some people think that being baptized in the Spirit is the same as being saved. It's not. 
is clear that it's not. In the whole book of Acts and in, 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 in the whole Bible, right? But it just means that there is more available for us. But this is the one commandment that Jesus told the disciples. Actually, the commandment was, don't go anywhere, but wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Because it's already in you. It's just like Jesus said. The new wine is only put in new wineskins. So you have to be a new wineskin already <laughs> to be able to get the new wine. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for unbelievers. Even Jesus had it, but he was already the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, the disciples got it on the day of Pentecost, but they had the Holy Spirit breathe in them in, in John chapter 20 after, in, uh, on the first day of uh, the resurrection at night. Okay. So that commandment is the commandment that... Uh, is exemplified in th those 40 days of teaching of Jesus really are summarized in this. Don't go anywhere. Stay in Jerusalem. You will receive uh, power. You, uh, you, you uh, will be my witnesses. And I command you not to go out of Jerusalem until you are filled with the Spirit, until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, notice that the commandments in the Spirit, that, that was a commandment by the Spirit, have power. And I don't have a lot of time here. I, I don't feel like I should go uh, too much longer. But let me say this. In verse 17, it says, Then Peter and John placed their hands on the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit. They received something else. They were already... Uh, believers, they were already baptized in water, and there was something else. Even even the 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 wizard, the sorcerer, in verse eighteen says, "Now Simon, when now Simon, when he saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of hands, the apostles' hands, offered them money, saying, give me this power too, so that everyone I place my hands on, uh, on might receive the Holy Spirit.'" But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could acquire God's gift with money. You have no share or part in this matter because your heart is not right before God. Remember, he had believed and had, and had gotten baptized, but his mind was still messed up. Right? Verse 22, Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that he may perhaps forgive you for the intent of your heart. Verse 23, for I see that you are bitterly envious and in bondage to sin. But Simon replied, you pray to the Lord for me so that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. So people say, you know, he needed to repent. He needed to change. But he said, no, 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 you pray and do it for me. It doesn't work. You have to do it. I have to do it. But going back to the, the commandments by the Spirit, I want to, I want to show you a few places um, on that. And um, this is what I want you to see. That, what was the example of the commandment? I'm asking you, uh, yeah, you can turn it off now. <laughs> off, completely off, yeah. Yeah. Everybody scroll now. Before my thoughts get frozen. Anyway, the commandment exemplified in Acts chapter 1, it says that, Jesus gave commandments by the Spirit. But the one example that is there is don't go anywhere. 
stay in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the commandment by the Spirit is be filled with the Spirit, right? Receive the Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. John baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so, let me say this. Um, when we talk about being born again, is it is a baptism. You're baptized in Christ. The Bible says that you're baptized into the body of Christ as a member of the body of Christ, and you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then to testify and, and, and you know, make it public, you get baptized in water. You know, if you're not born again, don't try to get baptized in water. It's not going to give you know, do you any good. But there's another baptism. There's several baptisms, really. Some of them are uh, only like for Jesus. He, he was baptized into our sin, into our uh, death, spiritual death. But now we're baptized into his life. Um, but then, just like him, we're baptized also. The Holy Spirit can come upon us for power. Um, so this is what I want to say. This is the same commandment in Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery or excess or uh, dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So it is a commandment to be Filled with the Spirit. Notice the first question of Paul to the disciples. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Or did, did you not? And they say, well, we didn't know about that. And the, he said, well, what did you get baptized in then? They say, well, in the baptism of John. Oh, okay, you're behind. He was preaching on about somebody that already came and died and resurrected. It's Jesus. Oh, when they heard that, they, they got baptized again in water in the name of Jesus. And then, when they came out of the water, Paul put his hands upon them. And they were filled with the Spirit. And they began speaking in other tongues and prophesying. Peter himself, on uh, the day of Pentecost, he said, And your children shall dream, dream, dream you know, uh, uh, dreams, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and you will prophesy, and you know, all that. So, that was what was happening in Ephesus. Um, here in Ephesians 5 uh, 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine. It's a, uh, let me ask something. Is this a suggestion that like, if you feel like this is okay, do not get drunk with wine, but, you know, and be filled with the Spirit? I, I suggest maybe if you have time, maybe if you are, people are being nice to you, maybe you feel like doing it. No, it's a commitment. You know, the, I, I'd love to go through the, Letters of the New Covenant, the New Testament, and find all the commandments that there are there. I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in Philippians it says, rejoice in the Lord. It's not a, it's not a suggestion. It says, and he says, again, rejoice. Paul is telling the Christians, rejoice in the Lord. It's a commandment. Is not a suggestion. And all of these things written in the, in the letters of the New Covenant are things by the Spirit. Paul said, what I preach, 
I don't preach because I came up with it or somebody else taught me. It was Christ himself directly revealed it to me. And in general, the Bible says that all scripture is inspired by God. You know, breathed out by God. So it's by the Spirit. That especially the New Covenant is things that are done now uh, in the Spirit. Before in the Old Covenant, it was on tablets of stone. But now we have a better covenant. And so there is this, and it says in verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts to the Lord. So it says that it's a commandment to, that to speak to one another. Uh, I believe some translation uh, give the idea also, which I think is valid, speaking to, to oneself. You can speak to yourself. Many of the Psalms that David wrote, he really was speaking to himself. You know, he was saying, God is my fortress. God is my refuge. You know, I will trust him. I, you know, and uh, he was encouraging himself in the Lord. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. How do you encourage yourself? You, you're going to have to speak to yourself. <laughs> Amen. In Psalms, which is, is basically uh, uh, what, what, who God is in terms of what, you know, who he is. And hymns is praise by, uh, you know, by what he has done, you know. But this is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And spiritual songs are revelation in, in form of a song or a poem that the Lord gives you. All these things you can practice in your uh, prayer life to be filled with the Spirit, to obey that command. He brings the power to, uh, to obey, so, uh, you know, to be able to obey that. I, I just want to uh, read one passage. And um, I believe it's uh, Matthew 14. Let's, let's go there. I guess I'm practicing for what I, I'm, I'm writing something for, for them. But it seems like they already got it in Colombia. But anyway, Matthew 14. Let me see where we are at. Okay. Matthew chapter 14, you're, you're getting there? Verse 22, we're going to finish with this, but I think this is a great example of what I'm trying to say. It says, walking on water, you know, Jesus uh, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dispersed the crowds. Verse 23, and after he sent the crowds away, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone. You know, he told his apples, you go ahead. He dismissed the people, and now he's by himself, and he has no boat. Verse 24, and now it's dark. And in verse 24, it says, meanwhile, the boat already far from land was Taking a beating from the waves because the wind was against it. Verse 25, as the night was ending, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. This is interesting to see. Some people say, oh, this is a proof that Jesus is God because, I mean, he's walking on the water. Well, I disagree with that because Peter walked on the water too. I know he sunk after a while, but he walked. And uh, that didn't mean that he was God. No, everything that Jesus did, he did it as an anointed man. He wasn't doing this to show off. He was doing this because there was a boat. So the only, only way to, to go to the other side and fulfill his purpose was to walk on the water. 
And God will enable you to do what you need to do to fulfill his plan. Jesus said, Father, you want me on the other side, right? So let's go. <laughs> Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking, uh, let me say this, that I heard a testimony, and I can't remember if it was China or Japan or some place in Asia, that uh, there was a group of believers that wanted to reach this town, and there was a river, and there was no bridge. So they believed God to walk on the, on the river, and they did. On the water. So the next year, they went back, and this time they didn't walk on the water. Why? Because there was a bridge. God was not going to do it again just to show off, only when it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> okay, now they can walk on the bridge. You don't need to, you know what I mean? A anyway, just side notes for that. Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified and said, he's a ghost, and cried out with fear. Wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you see somebody coming. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, uh, have courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. That's the message of Jesus, right? Verse 28, verse 28 Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. So what was the request? Order, order me. It's a commandment. Some version says, command or bid me to come to you. And so verse 29, what did Jesus say? Only one word, come. What did Peter need to be able to walk on the water? The command of God. When he obeyed the command, he started walking on the water. When he got afraid, he started sinking. There's no middle ground here. You're either in faith or in doubt or in fear, you know. But it says, so uh, Peter got out of the boat. Some people criticize Peter for, you know, walking on the water and then started sinking but and being afraid. But the other... Other 11 stay on the boat. At least he's walking. I'd rather be Peter. Even if he failed, he did way more than the others. But in the natural, he can do. He cannot do it. Uh, I cannot do it. I, it would have to be. And, and notice that it doesn't say. There's not a verse that said all believers will walk on water. It doesn't say. It was a specific rhema word for Peter. Now, if God speaks to you, you better make sure it's God speaking to you. But if he tells you to walk on water, you can. But he has to give you the command. Otherwise, you have no, uh, no uh, foundation to walk on or to do anything. It has to be a commandment. So what happens when he... Uh, God gives a commandment in his word. For example, walk in the spirit. That's not a suggestion. Do not uh, uh, satisfy the desires of the flesh. Is that a suggestion? If you feel like people are nice, so walk in the spirit. If they're not looking at you ugly, and, and then so be nice. No, it says walk in the spirit. It's a commandment. You know, it says, uh, it says more. Hold on. Hold on a second. Hallelujah. It says, for example, husbands love your wife. It's not a suggestion. Like Christ loved the church. You know, it does say uh, for the wife to submit to your husband, but that's after he said, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. So if you're not loving her like Christ loved the church, she doesn't have to submit either. Fair? Fair enough? Now, it's easy to submit to somebody that is loving you like Christ loved the church. That should be easy. 
Anyway, uh, it does say, be holy as I am holy. Is that a commandment or a suggestion? It's a commandment. By the Holy Spirit? Yes, by the Holy Spirit. To all believers? Yes, to all believers. But how can I be holy as God is holy? Is that, uh, isn't that a little extreme? He is super holy. <laughs> what does it mean that he's super holy? Very holy. It means that he is only, only exclusively going to do his word. He doesn't do anything outside or against his word. Um, so we have to be holy as he is and do exclusively the word of God. It says that Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. How long? Well, long enough to say that he was walking, that he was coming toward Jesus. He was making progress. How long? I don't know, but he was getting there. He's halfway, I don't know. Some, some good portion. In, in verse 30, when, when, when he saw the strong wind, he became afraid. And starting to sing, he cried out, Lord, save me. So he must have gotten close to Jesus because Jesus reached out his hand. It doesn't say that Jesus made a super jump and got to where he was, far away from him. So he got close enough to Jesus that Jesus could grab him with his hand. And caught him, saying to him, you little faith, why did you doubt? When they went up into the boat, the wind ceased. So they came back into the boat walking. It doesn't say that Jesus was carrying Peter in his arms. So apparently Peter walked back with Jesus to the boat. But why was he able to do this? It was because the commandment enabled him to surpass the laws of nature. And while he was in faith, in faith in obedience to that commandment, without doubting or fearing, he was able to do it. So you say, well, with my flesh, I'm so tempted with my flesh. Well, start obeying, so, you know, get in the spirit, get the revelation in, in the commandment that says, walk in the spirit. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Is that a suggestion or is a commandment by the spirit? You know, being filled with the Spirit, being uh, strong in the Lord, that is, that's, those are commandments. But how can I be strong uh, like he is? And Well, by obeying. But, you know, it's like the, the man that was in a stretcher for 18 years. I can't remember how long. This is in John 5. And... Uh, you know, if you've been on a stretcher for so long, you cannot move. Your muscles are very, very weak. Uh, and so he obeyed instead of looking for it. He had a lot of excuses. Like, I haven't walked in years. Doctor said, I cannot walk. Besides, you're telling me to carry my bed, and that's heavy. And I cannot get up. But instead of looking for, um, and, and he could have said, I am paralyzed. You know, you know what that means, Jesus? I cannot move. But instead of saying all these things that in the natural weren't tr false, I mean, weren't true, I mean, weren't false, <laughs> were true in the natural. But faith does not deny the natural circumstances. What faith does is sees that the commandment of God has more power than my natural circumstances and obeys. 
38 years. Thank you. That's a long time in a stretcher, right? You know, after the first year, you, he could say, after the first month, he could say, I cannot get up. After the first day, it's like, I, I can't move. But instead of looking for an excuse, which people say, but you don't know what happened to me, what people did to me, what, how long has it been? It does, Jesus said, oh, if you haven't been longer than five years, get up. No, he didn't say that. You know? Oh, if it's less than a month, maybe we have a chance. Get up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, Jesus said, get up. And in fact, Jesus knew that he had been there for a long time. It says that. You know, it's like Freddie Clark. I was interpreted for Freddie Clark in Colombia. And this guy with a, a sling in his arm. And um, is a young man. And I'm the interpreter. This is in Spanish. So I have to interpret for the person. The person answers, and I interpret for uh, brother, uh, brother Clark. And so he's moving in the spirit, in the, in the gifts of the spirit, and he sees this young man that wants prayer. And he tells the, the, the young man to start moving his arm. He has it in a cast, in a sling. And uh, I tell him in Spanish. He answers uh, to me in Spanish, but I translated that to Brother Clark. It's not that my arm is broken or, or sore or anything. It, I was in a car accident, and my arm was detached. And so the nerves are not reattached, reattached yet. That, I mean, they put it back together. But I cannot move it yet. It's, it's just a process, right, with, where the nerves get reattached and all that. And so I would have, I, I, I told that to Brother Clark. I thought he was going to say, oh, let's leave the arm uh, alone. Just pray for the, it's like I told, I, it's like I told Brother Clark, he just got a scratch in his arm. He, he, take here, take the, the sling, start moving your arm. I was like, wait, well, yeah, I was just the interpreter. So I'm not going to argue with Brother Clark, <laughs> right? He was the one moving in the spirit. I was just the interpreter. And um, anyway, the guy started moving his arm. So there was a row of all his family. All of them started crying. All of them got saved. None of them were saved. I mean, this guy had his arm detached from his body and couldn't move it, and that, but he obeyed the commandment and was able to do something that you can do. And I tell you, if you just find those commandments by the Spirit, rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, being anxious for nothing, that's a commandment. Read the, the letters of the New Covenant. They are things by the Spirit told to disciples. But I wanted to say something. We're, we're speaking, let me finish with this. <laughs> I'm trying to finish. We're speaking of the power of the Lord when He gives a commandment, right? And the ability that comes to us when we obey that commandment in faith. And so, basically, we're talking about the authority of God when he speaks. So let's talk about what else he has said with authority that is not necessarily a direct command, but he just says it as a fact. That's still authority. When he says that you're dead to sin, it's a fact. L let me give you an example. Let's say that there's a powerful king. Let's say that we live in a country where there's a king. And he's powerful. He has a powerful army. And he doesn't like you. You got him upset. You offended him or something. So he says... 
with all his bodyguards and his army, he says, you're a dead man. Do you think he has the authority to make it happen? Even though uh, you might still be alive, you can count on he's going to kill you. He has the authority, he's upset, and he can make it happen. He has the power to make it happen. You agree? So when God speaks, he has the authority. La the example I gave you was somebody saying, you're a dead man. Um, but you're still alive. But you can, you can start seeing like your funeral and stuff. Because why? Because that guy has a lot of power, a big army, and can make it happen. Right? So based on the authority and the power that that person has, you can all already start thinking on things that will happen because of what he said. He didn't say a commandment. He didn't say, kill him. But he said, you're a dead man. <laughs> Same thing. He's saying, you need to be dead. Right? And so when God speaks uh, in, in terms of facts, you know, he is using his authority. When he says, by my stripes, you were healed. It's even in past tense. We need to say, uh, let me say this. Look for the things that are in past tense in the new covenant. Where he says, we have been blessed. With Jesus. We were seated with Christ. We were resurrected with Christ. That's past tense. We were crucified with Christ. That's past tense. God is saying it's a fact. Act accordingly. You're crucified. You're dead to sin. You're seated with Christ. You're blessed. But I like one, one, one. I want to... Uh, have you finished with this? I believe it's Acts 13.47. And this is <coughs> nothing that I had prepared, right? I like uh, <laughs> Acts 13.47. I like Acts 14, uh, I mean 13.47. It says, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have appointed you to be a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So, it's a commandment. You are appointed as a light to bring salvation to people. So, well, I don't know how to do it. Well, just obey. <laughs> but I like also the fact that the word light is a word that means uh, to be luminous or to, um, you know, uh, light, w whether natural or, artifi or artificial. And also, it means fire. So you could read this this way. For I have come upon you to be fire for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It's a commandment to be on fire <laughs> and to be light. Oh, I didn't know I could bring salvation to people. Uh, in your flesh, you might not be able to save not even a fly, right? But in his commandment, in his power, Just like Peter walking on the water or the, the paralytic uh, getting up after 38 years. Who can do that? Only if you're obeying the power of the command. Oh, yeah. And let me just give you this. Hebrews 1. Do you like Hebrews 1? And uh, probably King James for this one. Okay. Hebrews 1, 3. Who, talking about Jesus, being the brightness of his glory and the expressive image of his person 
and upholding all things by the word of his power, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had uh, by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. But notice that he's upholding all things by the word of his power. You know, if, if I would have written that, I probably would have be tempted to say, that he's upholding everything by the power of his word. But it's the other way around. By the word of his power. Well, we believe that God is all powerful. But until he speaks, that power doesn't get a channel, a vessel where he can reach you and empower you. Let me say that God is power. You know, he's full of power. He is the power of God. But then he speaks out of, out of that power. Because he's almighty. But when he gives a command or states something as a fact, he's using his authority. And we need to obey accordingly. All right. Praise God. Let's, let's finish now. <laughs> Praise God. This is not what I was planning at all. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love your word. You said, you are my friends if you obey my commandments. So you said, my commandment is that you love each other. My commandment is for you to be filled with the Spirit. My commandment is for you to be holy as I am holy. My commandment is to walk in the Spirit, not satisfy the desires of the flesh. My commandment is for you to be strong in me and in the power of my might. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we, we humble ourselves un, un, under your mighty hand to obey your commandments, to obey your authority, to obey your word. And we thank you for your commandments of the new covenant that are given by the Spirit with the enablement to obey you in Jesus' name. Somebody's going to obey the commandment of rejoice in the Lord. It doesn't say, oh, but if things are going okay, if people are treating you right, then have a little bit of joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. L let's finish here. And uh, we thank you guys for being with us. And of course, we, uh, uh, you know, the, the one portion of Scripture that says that, you know, the grace of the Lord, that being rich, he became poor. So by his poverty, by his grace, you become rich. So basically, the Lord is saying that when Jesus took our poverty, we took his provision. With his, uh, we, we, we were made rich. means with pro provision in abundance. Um, that's a very, very much a fact that God is saying with his authority. You're rich. Amen. Well, I don't feel like it. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't say if you feel like it. Well, why well, I don't have that money in the bank. Well, yeah, it doesn't say if you have money in the bank, you're rich. But it, he it says that your God, when you're obeying him, he will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. 
So we, we obey his command. And notice that that was said in the context of some people sending an offering to Paul. And he said, I received the offering and my God will provide for all your needs. At this level, at the level of his riches in glory. You know, so we, some people just look at the need, but what you need to look at is the provision level. The provision level. Amen. Praise God. All right. God bless you.